Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you here to this uh, session on healthy and resilient cities. As all of you know, cities are becoming ever more important actors in global health. Uh, local is where people live, love, work, and play, as we say, and therefore the role of cities, the role of politicians at city level, of city governments, is becoming increasingly relevant. You will know that there is a number of new international initiatives around healthy cities, some of them focusing on specific issues like HIV AIDS or NCDs. Some of you will be familiar with the initiative that I started many years ago, the WHO Healthy Cities Initiative. And there are larger and smaller such initiatives, some of them focused on health, but others, of course, also focused on determinants of health. So therefore, initiatives that look at resilience, initiatives that look at the environment and other issues are, of course, also all contributing to health. We've tried in this panel to uh, collect some of these experiences, some of the thinking around uh, cities and health, which is also important because the majority of the world now lives, I don't know if we can say in cities, but at least in urban conglomerates uh, of all kinds uh, and sizes, millions of people living together which also gives mayors an increasingly important role in moving the agenda forward next to ministers and uh, prime ministers and getting that health on the political agenda of uh, city decision makers is also very critical. You will have seen from the program uh, that uh, we have uh, five speakers. We're very proud that uh, we have global representation. We're delighted that we have uh, gender balance. Uh, we have uh, politicians, ministers, representatives from international organizations, but also from academia to hear how a university can play a role in actually moving city health forward and uh, working directly with the community. The way that we will proceed is that uh, we will have uh, short presentations from our speakers. That's the format the World Health Summit has chosen for these keynote sessions. And uh, after we've heard these various dimensions uh, of uh, healthy and resilient cities, uh, we will have a discussion. I will ask a question or two but then we hope that uh, we can also open to you to either inform us of your city initiatives or to ask uh, questions of, uh, of the speakers. So we're delighted uh, you've joined us uh, on this and uh, we will move uh, straight away then into uh, the first uh, presentation. And I might also say, I encourage you to look up uh, all the um, professional and political background of our speakers. Uh, I'll not spend a lot of time on uh, you know, describing all uh, the great things they have done and achieved in their lives because uh, then we won't have any time for discussions. Trust us, uh, they are very well recognized people and uh, we are delighted that they have joined us here. So the first speaker is Professor Mazda Ali. He's the chair of the Fliedner Clinic uh, here in Berlin. And this is a clinic that brings together psychiatry, psychotherapy, and psychosomatic medicines. So you might ask, why is he here? And uh, he's actually written a very uh, well-received uh, uh, book recently, which is called Stress and the City. And uh, he will outline to us to get us into the mood of thinking about cities. On the one hand, what's positive about cities and health? Because it's not only that living in the city provides problems, but what's positive about urbanization and health, but also what are problems that can come with it. So Professor Adley, please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much uh, for this very nice introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, 
delighted to have you um, in this, uh, interested in this topic. Um, now, until the presentation start, starts, my question is, do city, cities drive us crazy? Um, that's the question that I um, am faced uh, in, in a daily life as a psychiatrist and stress researcher. And, my, I'm, and I must say, well, the answer is yes, in a way they do. Although cities mean freedom and uh, for many of us, probably most of us here, um, cities are positive stimulators for our development, for our education and personal well-beings. And as you all know, um, cities are the important so socialization and integration motors of our, for our countries, and they usually host the economic, political, scientific, and cultural power of nations. But our brains do not seem to be optimally designed for living in the densely populated metropolises of our world. It's, um, so why is this so? Um, it's understandable to all of us that cities, um, city living may mean stress, and, that st and we all know that increased stress exposure can have an impact on our lives and on our well-being. And yet, um, urban populations do, on average, live under improved conditions. They're wealthier and receive better sanitation contraception, and general health care. But city living is known to be a risk factor for some major psychiatric diseases. The risk for schizophrenia, and this is what I want to show you by this slide, is about twice as high um, for urban dwellers. And that even comes with a dose-response relationship for the amount um, one a person has grown up in a city. When you have spent the first 15 years of your life in a city, your risk for suffering from schizophrenia later as an adult is threefold compared to someone who has uh, been raised in an urban environment. And there are m more data which um, show that for, ex that, for example, the risk for depression is about 40% higher for urban citizens, and the risk for anxiety disorders is about 20% higher. Um, Higher. And these effects from epidemiological studies um, even remain stable if um, um, they are controlled for important confounders indicating that these epidemiological differences are only partly explained by, by population characteristics. Um, there is much more, uh, seems to be a causal relationship between city living and um, mental health. So this is what the causation hypothesis says, that city living causes, in a way, um, mental, Ill, uh, mental ill health, as opposed to the selection hypothesis, um, which would state that it is um, high-risk individuals who rather move into urban areas because they hope for better health care, for example. But that still does not mean that city living, per se, is harmful for our mental health. It rather means that living urban or not interacts with our brains and with other risk factors, such as genetic, psychological, or social risk factors. And why is this important? Because the global population living in cities is growing dramatically, and I would even say that urbanization is the global change appearing within the next decades with, with probably a comparable health impact as climate change has on us. You probably know these figures. Um, as of today, about slightly more than 50% of uh, the urban population lives urban, and by 2050, about two-thirds of the urban population will be living in um, urban uh, environments, and that is an enormous change. Now, as, as I said, um, the, uh, stress seems to be an important mediator, but what is exactly urban stress, city stress, and how does it get under the skin? Um, we've, we're following a social stress hypothesis, which says that it's social stress which has a health impact, which has a mental health impact. And social stress um, in this respect means the simultane simultaneity of social density on the one hand and social isolation on the other, which then can add 
uh, to a toxic mix which becomes mental health relevant. It has been shown for both of these stressors that they have a health impact, for example, social density, which means a constant threat for the social order we live in, has been shown to um, result in illnesses in, uh, and behavioral alterations in almost all species, um, beginning from insects to um, uh, rodents, primates, and then also to the complex human organism. And also it has been shown for social isolation that it um, is one of the most important negative health predictors that we are aware of. This is a meta-analysis which shows, these are the two bars that are circled here, social isolation is a, is, um, um, is a stronger negative predictor for health outcomes than obesity, than smoking, or um, alcohol consumption. Um, oops. And now, these stressors m m um, mix with other risk factors, for example, social factors or, or personal um, characteristics. Um, this has been shown f by a study from uh, our department at the Charité, um, a study done by Andreas Heinz, um, which shows that the um, poverty around you is much more important for your mental health outcome than your own poverty. They have assessed the mental health of um, urban population living in the, um, in, um, in the rather poorer neighborhoods of Berlin, and the higher the bars, the, the, the stronger the negative health, mental health impact, and the darker the red, um, the poorer the environment around you. So the, the, the local poverty is more important to your uh, mental health outcome than your own poverty. That's the, uh, one of the key messages here in this study. Now, what is the consequence? Um, the first consequence is cities are not harmful per se, but they change um, the way we, we deal with stress. They s uh, change our s the stress-associated uh, emotional processing in individuals. But it's mu now what is much uh, of, of high importance is to understand much better how the inter-individual differences of stress vulnerability of urban populations are. Where are the risk populations? Who are the people in the cities who, who suffer from the urban stress without having adequate um, access to the urban advantage? Urban advantage um, as, um, as uh, to, to be understood as the um, cultural diversity, as the social richness, as the uh, as access to, to, to good education and personal development. Um, if, if access to the, uh, the so-called urban advantage is low, is weak, then this, um, the social stress appearing in, stre uh, in, in cities might not be adequately counterbalanced, uh, counterbalanced with, uh, which may result in uh, a mental health problem. So we also must investigate the effect of urban stressors on the developing brain. I told you that the first 15 formative years of one's living might be um, um, extremely important for the mental health outcome uh, of an individual. And what we do need, what we do need in light of this, is a public mental health strategy um, for city dwellers, for city government, uh, governors. And this is, and this is my last slide, what uh, we are aiming at currently here in Berlin. Um, we call this neurourbanism, and it's a joint project and joint methodology of neuroscientists, psychiatrists, psychologists on the one hand, and architects, city planners, sociologists on the other to better understand how to shape cities that are better for our mental health, that, uh, that uh, provide access to the urban advantage and keep social stress for urban dwellers low. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Adli. We'll come back to some of these issues. It was important for us to start with a link to Berlin, our host city here, but also to highlight the issue of mental health, which is often undervalued in the context of global health discussions. And finally, you heard a new concept, neuro-urbanism. Uh, to some extent, uh, that kind of thinking has... Uh, of course, been uh, uh, attempted with some of the projects that you'll be hearing from now. 
and uh, we'll be able to take that forward. I'd like to ask the Minister of Health of Qatar, uh, Dr. Hanan Mohammed al kuwari uh, to come up uh, and, uh, and speak. Uh, she will also give us an entry point to understand the interface between urban development, urban planning and health. And of course, you know, in the part of the world where she comes from, there has been an enormous urban growth. And uh, I'm sure many of the effects that we just heard from the professor also apply to your part uh, of the world and your cities. Please, Minister, the word is yours. Thank you. Thank you for this kind introduction. And I'd like to also thank the um, organizing uh, committee for uh, this wonderful event and for the City of Berlin for hosting us. Um, my talk will focus on how we are building a resilient and healthy city in the light of the rapid ur urban development that Qatar is going through. Um, overall, Qatar is a healthy city, so we, our healthcare system is strong. Um, life expectancy, child mortality, maternal mortality are comparable to the OECD, but we face the same challenges as you face, an um, increase in lifestyle-related diseases and the increase of uh, diseases related to environmental risks. Most specifically uh, for us, a challenge that's quite unique is the rapid growth of our city. So if you can see in this slide, in 2006, we were 1 million, and now we are 2.5 million. So that's a very rapid expansion, which has done wonders to the healthcare system because it has um, created an investment in infrastructure and facilities. But our challenge now ahead of us is how do we transform that focus from infrastructure, physical development into public health and a healthy lifestyle and city. Um, we have a clear vision and strategy to do that, and over the next slides, I'll share with you that strategy and examples of where, um, where that has been delivered and where we're planning to deliver that. So our approach to the transformation is creating a platform um, which focuses on three elements, um, a strong leadership and a clear strategy, the importance of public engagement and support, as well as health in all policies. By focusing on these three elements, um, we are ensuring that the transformation that we aspire through our national strategy is achieved. If you can see um, on this photo, we have His Highness, the Emir of Qatar, who is um, engaging in one of our activities, which is a national sports day. So a couple of years ago, when His Highness realized the level of obesity in the country and overweight, he created an initi initiative in which everybody, uh, schools, uh, public health workers, private health workers, have one day off where we all engage in sports. And he joins us actively in sports. And I can say that over the last couple of years, I've seen a true transformation in the acceptability of sports. Um, and more and more people are going out, they're exercising, they're, they're joining uh, sports clubs because of that initiative and because of the direct leadership of His Highness. Um, we're focusing a lot on public engagements and campaigns across the city, but more importantly, we're working with all the different sectors to ensure that health is in, um, a health assessment is, a, is, a, is done in every policy. What we're doing also is um, we're engaging the public in our new strategies and in our health strategies. Um, so over the last decade, we focused on building um, facilities, health facilities to increase access to health. But now with our new public health strategy, we're focusing on lifestyle. Um, instead of launching the public health strategy in, in the normal way that you do that, what we did is we launched a um, public engagement campaign where we asked the public, what would you like to see in the public health strategy and where would you like us to focus? And we've had 15,000 of our citizens respond to that strategy and that strategy has also informed our new national health strategy um, which focuses on a paradigm shift. So in the new national ha health strategy, we're focusing on how can we achieve better health, better value, better care for our population in the different segments of the population, children, um, the aging population, women, uh, people with special needs, and so on. One, in, one example of the successful um, behavioral change that we have achieved in Qatar is the way in which we tackled road traffic accidents. In 2006, the road traffic accidents in Qatar has peaked to um, 29 per 100,000 population. That's very high, as you know. 
Um, and through a concerted effort with uh, the other ministries, specifically the Ministry of Interior and Transportation, we have achieved a uh, significant reduction and uh, the figure is now uh, close to six per 100,000 population. So that shows a real effort um, over the last 10 years. But the success of this initiative is because, number one, it was led by the other ministries. You do not achieve health by focusing on the Ministry of Public Health or the health sector. You achieve health by engaging all the other stakeholders. And in this initiative, the Prime Minister, who's the Minister of Interior, took personal leadership of this project. Um, and what he has done in that committee is that he has um, uh, transformed the roads, so changed the roads, removed the roundabouts, focused on red lights, changed the rules and regulations, stricter enforcement of seat belts and introducing seat belts into our culture. And that, um, as well as public campaigning, has made a difference in the road traffic accidents rate. The second initiative which we're hoping to um, achieve similar results is in smoking. So 32% of our men smoke in Qatar. And we have a cultural um, uh, issue to tackle here because the perception on smoking is not as, um, uh, as high risk or is not perceived as, as high risk as in the West because of um, the culture of smoking the shisha, which is perceived as something that is not um, risky for your uh, health. Um, so we have engaged um, our, and we're starting a, a strong campaign to focus on the health risks of smoking. We've also introduced new legislation and um, uh, as a result of that, we're seeing an improvement. However, it's not yet where we would like it to be. But we know that by focusing on smoking cessation clinics, we have very high success rates with 30% of our uh, patients quitting smoking after joining the, um, the clinics. We're also moving healthcare closer to the public. Um, we've created a number of wellness centers. We've shifted from the traditional primary healthcare concept to a wellness concept where um, close to your home, you have a family medicine practice, you have a screening unit, as well as a gym, spa facility and in one location. And it's becoming a center around the community. We've opened four of these. We plan to open another four in the next few years, as well as another 10 um, uh, uh, over the next five years. Um, and we believe that through this approach, we will help people stay healthy throughout the year, especially in the summer season where walking and outdoor sports is difficult. And finally, um, we have focused a lot on urban development and, um, and uh, transforming the city itself. So the new rail, uh, which, is, um, op which will open in two years' time, will help us with controlling um, air quality and pollution and increase uh, walkability in the city. Two city developments or community developments within the city of Doha that might be interested to those of you interested in architecture is two projects. One is Lusail, which is by the waterfront in the north, and then one is called Msherib, which is the one on, on the left, which is a redevelopment of an old uh, souk district. And these two projects are very interesting because they look at walkability, health, they look at um, uh, ecological buildings, as well as um, protecting the uh, flora or the ocean, um, uh, um, the health of the ocean and the fish in the, um, uh, by the marine. Also, um, we're using the World Cup 2022 as a platform to achieve behavioral change. We're working with the Committee of the Supreme Council of Legacy, um, and we created a behavioral economics unit, which is looking at how can we nudge people into the right behavior, and we're hoping that that will encourage active, and, uh, uh, active population in sports and recreation. So I hope that you will be able to join us in Qatar and see some of these developments, if not before the World Cup, but maybe for the World Cup, and I hope that um, uh, together we can achieve the transformation that's required for the next generation so that the next generations can enjoy healthy cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. And uh, you can see we have uh, consciously tried in the presentations to really also show you examples of what is happening, what is being done, and particularly highlighting how intersectoral this is the word health in all policies, I think, is something that will appear a couple of times uh, as uh, uh, we uh, hear further presentations here. Without further ado, we'll move to Iran, to Tehran, and I'm inviting Professor Dr. Ali Jafarian 
from Tehran uh, University of Medical Sciences, uh, until recently the Chancellor, uh, to uh, tell us how uh, the university hospital, how the university as a whole can contribute uh, to uh, addressing urbanization issues, particularly NCD issues, I believe, uh, in uh, Tehran. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And uh, I should thank the organizers of this uh, meeting, of this prestigious meeting, to give us this opportunity to share with you our experiences in the capital city of Tehran as a university. Uh, I want to start uh, with that what I am uh, you know, giving you this lecture as a chancellor of the university. Uh, of course, until two weeks ago, which my turn was ended, and now I'm a member of board and also a consultant to the Minister of Health and also working with the university. Since 1985, uh, Iran has enjoyed a unique health governance where medical education was integrated to healthcare services. If you look at this uh, slide, it is maybe self-evident. There is a Ministry of Health and Medical Education, which is H-O-M-E. And then there are deputy ministers, and there are medical universities. At the first step, universities in the country were divided into two large groups, medical sciences under the new Ministry of Health and Medical Education, and comprehensive universities under the Ministry of Higher Education. And after maybe a decade, this is the structure of the university itself. And as you see here, these are uh, vice chancellors of the university. And there is a health network, or maybe two or three health networks under each university, which usually is uh, uh, run by the vice chancellor for public health in the university. So that's why in Iran, the universities of medical sciences are in charge of serving people for primary health care and also secondary and tertiary health care. This aim to be utilized the resources for training health provider and establishing community-oriented and accountable medical education. As a result, uh, many community hospitals joined the university setting and the number of medical students was doubled in less than five years. We lack enough uh, you know, general practitioners and, uh, and MDs in the country, and we have to import some MDs before the revolution in Iran. And for example, TUMS was also the first university in the region to establish Department of Social Medicine and train social-oriented medical practitioners. So uh, as the chancellor of this, such a university, which is the oldest and biggest one in the country, I was responsible to provide healthcare services for 2.8 million population, which is a part of this 10 million population of the whole city of uh, uh, Tehran. And uh, I am now sharing with you three examples of that, uh, uh, the, the, the actions that we uh, took uh, in these years. First, in 2008, along with four adult global cities in partnership with WHO, we implemented the Urban Heart Health Equity Assessment and Response Tool to assess equity in Tehran as a key action towards universal health coverage. This activity was led by the Strategic Health Council of Tehran. This council is a part with municipality, and there is a big part from the university side. And uh, uh, when, if you see this one, this is a health house. It is a neighborhood health house run by the municipality, and the universities, the medical universities, were taking part to this uh, uh, big uh, study in Tehran. And then we shared the result with, uh, with all municipality supported and people manage health house across 374 neighborhoods in each locality. And uh, this resulted in definition of 52 health equity indicators for the whole Tehran community that was endorsed by the cabinet and led to an action plan for social determinant of health in the country. Uh, this is just an example, as you see. These are our 22 districts in Tehran, and these are the indicators that was studied in the, in the first round of Urban Heart. As you see, we have some you know, neighborhoods uh, in some districts that are deprived and some better. These are the northern, as you can see in this map, and these are the south. And for example, for mental disorder, as Dr. Adli was uh, you know, mentioning, you see that there was bad condition here and better condition in this northern part. 
And this is another example. There are a lot of such maps that I'm just showing as, as examples. This is for uh, women overweight and obesity. And you see this south and this east part of the city condition is not so good. The next experience, uh, I want to share the uh, project that we call it Tabassum. This is the abbreviation for optimal development of health in a neighborhood in Persian. So this is a community, community participation model for health initiative that our School of Public Health started in the slum areas of Yazd, ancient city in the middle of Iran. One of our uh, senior faculty members, Dr. Hossein Malik Afzali, uh, which is a distinguished professor in TUMS, selected a relatively deprived area of 4,000 households in periphery of this city, divided them into 40 clusters, each including 100 neighborhoods, and each cluster selected a man and a woman for gender balance. And uh, through training and capacity building, the university has empowered these 80 citizens with some skills like need assessment and preliminary analysis. Along with trustworthy citizens of each neighborhood and government representative, these 80 people have established Health General Assembly of the neighborhood, where the first 10 health priorities were determined and then approved by the chairman of the assembly and mutually signed by the local responsible governmental organization for implementation, which will be then monitored to measure them. As you see, this, this is uh, the, the, the classes for the women for capacity building and teaching them what they need as the representative. And the final uh, uh, report that I want to share with you is, uh, uh, to, is, the, is our practice to reduce the NCD risk factor. Our university, along with other universities in the country, has been in constant partnership with National Committee for NCD in Iran to design, implement, and evaluate the European package, which is our national approach for early detection of NCD risk factors, risk score assessment, and cost-effective interventions to control and prevent NCD, and reduce the 30% the premature deaths attributed in, the, in, for, in, in NCD. This is a four by four by four strategy that the whole country was st uh, started that. And what in TMS we did, in our catchment area of 2.8 million population, with expected prevalence of diabetes of like 10% and hypertension of 24%, we set the goal of 90% access, 90% risk assessment, and 90% active follow-up in five years. And now we are in the second year of that period of time. And this is what we hand to the people. This, the red card is for the risk assessment of more than 30% and the green card for 10% and the yellow card with 10 to 30. So the people are engaged in their care. And we follow that actively. Let me finish by re-emphasizing that as much as urbanization has brought enormous challenges to materialization of SDG3 in Iran, medical universities, including our university, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, have created a reliable interface between SDG3 and SDG11 to make urban environments safer, particularly man uh, participatory managed and resilient, hence contributing to the key dimensions of sustainable development goals. Thank you, and I'm open to the questions. Thank you very much, Professor Jafarian. And uh, again, just for me to highlight the whole issue that you heard here of involving people, of social participation, of having projects that really go out into the community and linking that to the important issue of the social determinants and making sure that this interface of poverty, of inequality, is clearly a part of uh, the strategy. And I think, again, that's a message we are hearing. In this case, it was also very clear the importance of measurement and being able to show outcomes and progress, which then leads to hopefully a virtuous cycle of continuous investment and moving forward. International organizations have also become very active in working with cities one of the most recent initiatives in that uh, case has been uh, from UNAIDS, an initiative called Fast Track Cities. 
And uh, we have with us Dr. Jose Zuniga, who from UNAIDS is the special advisor on fast track cities. And he's going to share with us how they have uh, moved forward, why they have uh, chosen this kind of approach, and maybe also already what first results one is able to see. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to the World Health Summit for providing a voice for us to speak about the intersection between urbanization and health conditions, including HIV. I'm honored to be here in Berlin, uh, the first German city to sign on as a fast-track city, um, where a tremendous amount of, of progress is being made through a partnership between communities affected by HIV AIDS, the government, and clinical and service providers. The Fast Track Cities Initiative was launched in, on World AIDS Day 2014 in the city of Paris between four core partners, UN AIDS, IAPAC, UN Habitat, and the city of Paris, aiming to accelerate local AIDS responses in high HIV burden cities around the world to attain 90-90-90 targets by 2020. The initiative started with 26 cities assigned on on that date, and to, as of this morning, uh, we have a little over 200 and, 216 cities that have signed, among which we have prioritized 85 um, as cities where, if we accelerate AIDS responses, we can reach a tipping point to achieve epidemic control. Why the city focus? Well, some of this has already been addressed by other speakers. The fact is by 2050, 64% of the developed world and 86% of the developing world will be urbanized. Um, with the highest rates of urbanization happening in the Africa and Asia region. And almost all population growth from this year through 2030 will be absorbed by cities, or 1.1 billion people. A stress on the health systems of these uh, cities to be sure, and thus a, a focal point for us as we address HIV AIDS, specifically because in 200 cities around the world, 25% of people living with HIV AIDS reside. And so if we can have an effect in these cities, we can alter the course of the HIV epidemic. The targets for the initiative are 90, 90, 90. 90% 90 of people living with HIV AIDS knowing their HIV status. 90% of people living with HIV who know their status on antiretroviral therapy, which has both therapeutic and preventative effects. And 90% of people living with HIV on ART achieving what we call viral suppression, or undetectability of virus in, in blood tests, without which we do not achieve the, the therapeutic and preventative effects of antiretroviral therapy. Finally, there's a 0% stigma and discrimination target associated with the initiative as a means of addressing a very clear barrier, not just to uh, safeguarding the human rights of people affected by HIV and AIDS, but also presenting an incredible barrier for accessing and utilizing HIV services. For us, the 90-90-90 targets are an on-ramp to HIV epidemic control, the beginning and not the end of the journey for our cities as we ask them post-90-90-90 to then achieve 95-95-95 targets as well as epidemic control targets. So we're in the right place. 200 cities account for over 25% of pe people living with HIV AIDS, and that trend will continue. And in many countries, one city accounts for more than 40% of people living with HIV AIDS in the country. As has been expressed by the speakers, cities are laboratories of innovation. There's an urban advantage that has been spoken about as well, which allows us to mobilize communities that are active across numerous sectors towards the goal of achieving the, the initiative's targets. We also know that through data-driven uh, initiatives, we can have an impact specifically in districts, provinces, neighborhoods where the resources are most needed, and we can target our resources in those areas so that we do not squander the scarce resources that we have. The right thing is prioritizing 90-90-90, 95-95-95, -90 as well as placing as many cities as possible on trajectory towards HIV epidemic control. Something we thought was not possible, was, was merely a rhetorical flourish up to a few years ago when we discovered the preventative effect of antiretroviral therapy. But as important, through recent uh, public health impact assessments, we've identified that even in, city, in countries such as Swaziland, 
which has the highest prevalence of HIV on, in sub-Saharan Africa, we can place a country on the path toward epidemic control simply by addressing 90, 90, 90, and zero discrimination barriers. These barriers include stigma and discrimination, as I've already alluded to, the importance of early testing and diagnosis, and placing people on HIV treatment as soon as possible after diagnosis so they do not progress to late-stage disease. HIV treatment is critical, as is the importance of remaining adherent to achieve viral suppression. And finally, as we keep people alive longer, it's important to note the quality of life of these individuals, including those issues related to aging with HIV. I'll quickly go through some of our experiences with, with several cities. The city of Amsterdam, which signed in 2014, um, had an organic initiative, the Getting to Zero initiative, which we helped to propel through uh, renewed energy around the Fast Track Cities initiative. Very quickly after the initiative, um, the city health department introduced wider range of entry points for HIV testing and sexual health, and we saw significant increases in the numbers of people tested for HIV and linked to care. As important, harm reduction services were increased, and we saw a high coverage among people who inject drugs shortly after the initiative was launched. Community engagement is key, as, and thankfully, um, the city of Amsterdam attained the 90-90-90 targets in 2016. You'll note here the progress between the, the initial or baseline numbers in 2014, so they were at 93, 88, 94. They achieved 94, 90, 94 in 2016, and became the first fast-track city to attain the targets. The city of Bangkok, equally, as a metropolitan area, we focus its HIV response to address the needs of key populations, particularly MSM, sex workers, and transgender individuals, by establishing discrete services for these individuals that were culturally and otherwise relevant. And you see this 9090 data are indicated here. Nairobi County signed in 2014. Strong political will and community engagement, as well as effective partner coordination, have helped to propel that city towards development of a fast-track roadmap and strategic AIDS plan that is allowing for steady increases in the numbers of people who are being tested. In fact, their HIV testing campaigns have increased coverage to 71% as a result of the work they've been doing. And the city of New York City itself has, uh, has a getting to zero initiative, but through the work of the Fast Track Cities Initiative was able to conceptualize their HIV programming to focus on the need to promote HIV testing and the whole person through their sexual health uh, clinics around the city. Two other quick cities, the city of Paris, uh, which was the initial city to sign the declaration, um, implemented a towards an ACE-free Paris strategy that guides the city in all of its response, including the allocation of resources, with outreach to key populations, the promotion of combination prevention, and a, a reduction in the price of HIV self-testing commodities, which has allowed for steady increase in the number of people self-tested. Sao Paulo equally has integrated the health services and is actively working on free condom distribution in public areas as a means of ensuring that we have a, a whole response to HIV beyond simply test, treat, and virally suppress. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you can see also how through a specific disease in terms of working with cities, you can reach out through participation to the population, to the most vulnerable, and uh, actually get all city action to address such issues. We now move on to uh, another approach, uh, which was uh, initially uh, spearheaded by the World Health Organization, the Healthy Cities Project, which I believe is around 30 years now. And uh, we have with us the Deputy Mayor of Rennes, Charlotte Marchandise Franquet, who is going to share with us both mm. some of the values of healthy cities, but also what it meant for her city and her work. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you for inviting politicians. Uh, I think it's really important to have several points of view and also to have these places to exchange because uh, as you often say, because many of the things I say are coming from 30 years of experience on, on experimentation and, and recommendation from Healthy City. Health is a political choice. And I'll try to go through examples how 
on local stakeholders can implement the recommendation of international organization, the recommendation of researchers. So, healthy city network, 30 years, uh, 1,300 cities in Europe, 29 national networks. The French healthy city, so Rennes, this is my city, so if somebody didn't know it. And we have right now 90 cities acting on health determinants. Just to see. First of all, this is the strength of a network. I've been uh, elected four years ago, and what I know is because of the people of my city, the technical people, the civil servants have been teaching me, but also because the networks have been teaching me. And the local empowerment is the first strength of the network. How do we train politicians? Or not train, make seminars because we know many things, but yet we don't know about public health. How do we share best practices? How do we share our problems? It's really hard to have evaluation and to have infra communal data, and we need infra communal data. So we share, we empower politicians locally, and we empower health politicians because sometimes when you're deputy mayor for health, all the other sectors don't see you with like, oh, wow, health is coming. It's like, oh, health is coming. With you, you cannot smoke, you cannot drink, it's not funny. So how do we empower health politicians so that they are legitimate and they're champions, as you say, in other sectors? Then national advocacy. Because we are 90 cities in France, because we are 1,300 cities in Europe, we can go and see our governments and say, hey, this law, you need to change something. This subject to this matter for air pollution, for mental health, for sports and health, the decision you are making, we cannot apply them on local level because sometimes national representatives, national civil servants, they don't know actually how we are working on local level. And then international connections and the last ministerial conference in Ostrava for 53 state members, uh, for the first time healthy cities were invited, cities were invited, and cities, healthy and sustainable cities are a priority. So that's all the up and go, because also when we speak on Ostrava, we have more empowerment locally. When I'm tweeting from Berlin in World Health Summit, I'm more important in my city, so I've got more money to make project. Health in all policy is the approach that I've been uh, major in the governance of healthy cities for the last 30 years. So it's getting everybody around the table, at least two or three at the same time, and always putting equity at the center. We don't want a healthy city that is healthy just for a few people, for the people of the center of the city. We want equity. We want to work on proportionate universalism. We want to have the same health actions for everybody, but putting more for the people who need more. And that's really what I'll try to show, is that when we talk about the subject, how do we not forget about equity? Talking about gender equity, about uh, social equity, all these kind of things, fighting discriminations. First example, health and urbanism. Health impact assessments uh, have been raising in the past year, and that's a good example, but that's not the only one. We're trying to work a lot. We've been making the first health impact assessment uh, back in 2013 in Rennes, the first one in France, not in the world, obviously, and that was for a, a, a new train station, well, an old train station becoming a, a, a new one, and that was really interesting. To, to be in a place where we actually could talk about health uh, positively. And the, the people from different sectors, the people from urbanism, the people from, uh, from architect were saying, oh, so I'm acting on health. I didn't know that. So we're using that uh, to go on. We're using the leadership about uh, having been the first to change new uh, urbanism and put it systematically. And we are very proud to have a health on our local urban plan. Uh, so it's, for now, it doesn't mean that all urbanist people are taking into account health. It means that if they're not, we are legitimate to say, hey, hey, you signed it up. Health is here. Don't forget it. So for instance, making a new school, if it's really close from a big road, well, we can turn the recreation, the park, so that the kids are not on the way of the pollution, but we can change it. That is really important, and that is really new on city governance. Health and physical activity. 
uh, we need to tackle it from many places. We need to focus on the inequities. So it's street working, it's uh, walking plants and saying to people, not you have to walk, but oh, see, just five minutes from here to there. Don't take the subway, don't take the bus, Choose, you can walk five minutes. And, and it's raising the bicycle, because bicycle, cycling is good for mental health, for instance. When you're crossing cars, you're crossing objects. When you're crossing people walking or cycling, you're crossing subjects. So you usually don't talk the same way to the people when you're cycling than when you're uh, uh, driving. Yet, if we don't make the good, uh, the good cycling roads, it doesn't work, because then it's really stressful. And also really having this thing on doing it on the priority neighborhoods all the time. For air pollution, which is a big issue, and this is win-win issue. We're talking about climate change, we're talking about green spaces, we're talking about physical activity. And what we've done uh, in order to, to get people in the room with us, to work with citizens, to have this democratic level, uh, we gave citizens the sensors, air sensor, to measure air. Not in order to say, oh, the national air measurement is not good. In order to say, oh, okay, this is where air pollution is. So they had this air beam, which is actually the, the one of the sensors that works the best and that's more reliable. And on PM, uh, it doesn't do uh, NO2 for people who have questions. But then they can see, and that uh, was one of the, of the road one purpose said, that there's this corner where there's always air pollution. And this is where there's a gas station and there's always car there. So the people, when they saw that, they decided to go on another way and go around. So we can have something much more empowering, much more useful for people when we give them the means to act. And we also give them the means on a participatory budget to act and change the infrastructure and make their own project. So at the end, what we do uh, as a network, international network, local network, and also locally, is empowering champions for health and well-being. Thank you very much. From here to equality. <laughs> Thank you. And I think it's very encouraging to have a politician here on the panel saying, I'm committed to health. I think health is a political choice. And, uh, I'm going to contribute to it. So I think from the presentations, a number of uh, very critical central issues have emerged. Participation, of course, first and foremost, multi-sectorality, not just physical health, physical and mental health, equity, 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 again and again. The interface between environmental and personal health, a very, very important notion and uh, the need of very many different actors. And uh, when we started the Healthy Cities Project, one of our uh, initial thoughts was, you know, anyone can start to act on health. One doesn't need, you know, it's great if the emir and the head of government gives a push, but basically at every point of everyday life and every point of decision making, one can actually be a health champion and move it forward. Professor Adley, if you've listened to these, you're the academic here, you work with people in practice also uh, every day. What uh, are some of the things that occurred to you as you were listening to the colleagues here? Well, um, I think what, what I've, what I've extremely encouraging is that there is um, that that there are public health strategies um, for urban areas evolving in one or the other way and uh, so I found these examples that I that I heard from Tehran from Re from Qatar um, uh, absolutely encouraging but I do think that mental health is still something that which really needs to be empowered because we, we, we've heard and we know so much about physical health um, in urban areas, but we know so, so little about what really impacts mental health in city dwellers. And I do think this needs to be promoted. 
Thank you. Maybe I can go to Jose then, because your issues around stigma, etc., of course, relate very much to such mental health issues. How much does that come to the fore? How much uh, do you look at it and work uh, with the people concerned, but also mental health professionals, etc., within the cities that you work with? Sure. We, we recognize through our work in, in numerous cities that the issue of stigma and discrimination, as I mentioned, is an incredible barrier to accessing and utilizing services. But as important, depression, anxiety, um, and other mental health conditions are affecting people living with HIV AIDS in significant ways. So one of the ways in which the Fast Track Cities Initiative is trying to gain additional knowledge about how significant a barrier the, the, these, these issues are is through a quality of life survey that's being conducted across 30 cities in the, in the Fast Track Cities network. That will allow us a snapshot of, of what's really happening in these cities beyond the 90-90-90, beyond viral suppression, so that it can be addressed locally in a very significant way. Madam Minister, how important is mental health uh, in your strategies and uh, how visible is it? Is it easy for your citizens to talk about mental health or what kind of strategies do you need to use? Um, mental health is an important element of our strategy. We actually have a national mental health strategy which focused initially on eliminating the stigma around mental health with improving access to mental health services. We found that um, when mental health services are hospital um, public has a hard time accessing it. So what we did is we worked with the local communities, we worked with the local wellness centers, we looked uh, with local um, health clerics to talk more about mental health. Um, and that really helped with stigma. A lot of our public that do have mental health issues, we've asked them to and speak about that. So that's really helped. So we have shifted from a community that, that mental health was a topic of taboo to one that now talks more about mental health. But still, so, uh, hope that sorry, mental health to the community. And I think that's how you get rid of the stigma. And then physical activity, sports, we know that physical activity, we know uh, having environments and uh, physical activity, um, your physical environment, being able to um, look at green spaces, walk, um, interact, um, look at the sea, that makes a big difference on, on the mental health of the city. Yes. Yeah. I think that issue about you know, how the uh, general environment actually influences mental health is a very important one. I remember when I was in Tehran, working th walking through that beautiful park that you have recently created, that that uh, probably also makes a difference in terms of quality of life. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you, uh, Dr. Farian, in terms of you know, the, the understanding also of well-being, of quality of life, because we heard there's a shift here. We used to talk about healthy cities. Uh, we have, of course, in the WHO the definition that it's about health and well-being. And this well-being notion, this quality of life notion, is getting a sort of different dimension, a different understanding. How would you see that for Tehran and maybe also for the culture in your country in general? Uh, let me just uh, point out a point about the mental health. Uh, what we have done in the past two years, and it is one of the part of our action plan, is to have a mental health caregiver in our health centers in the urban area. And, uh, you know, the estimated prevalence of uh, not major but severe mental problems is between 20 and 30, mostly depression and anxiety and the violence and so on. So this is a major health problem in a large city like Tehran with more than 10 million population. So that is a part of plan and uh, the uh, at the, not at the level of the health house or health base, but at the health level of the health centers in the, in the urban area. And we also have, uh, I don't know if you, uh, you, have, you visited there, but we have some, uh, according to cultural issues, we have some uh, private areas for women, like great parks and so on. They can go there and do the, the exercise and do the sports and so on, besides all uh, the public areas. And uh, when we go to well-being, that is another issue. Uh, 
I think that we should uh, inform all of the people that they should be self-caregiver and that they should be self-aware. Because the health is not something that we could uh, make a pill and give them to eat that. They, want, they should uh, know and act as they know. If the cigarette smoking is not healthy, they should do something about that. And this is a part not just done by us. You know, the media, the politicians, and everybody who is in contact with people should uh, take this responsibility to, to increase the information of the people about the health issues. And when we go to well-being, it is something more than health, because it is not, this is not just health. There are a lot of healthy people that do not feel well. So we have to do something that, and we have to encourage another aspect of well-being, maybe spiritual, you know, and uh, more than psychological, it is spiritual and so on. And again, the politicians have a major role in that sensation of well-being, because if the community is, you know, in a comfortable uh, situation politically, and there are not a lot of, you know, uh, juggles and so on, so the people feel better. Even they are healthy or they are not healthy. And that help us a lot, especially in mental health, to promote this feeling of well-being around the community. Thank you, Charlotte. That automatically comes to you uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, well-being of the people in your city, how that is expressed, how it is measured. But also as you respond there, I'd, I'd like you to, to uh, share with us how as a politician you balance the issue of you know, the personal contribution of people and the structural environmental action that is needed. Because as the Ottawa Charter said, we need both. We need active people, we need personal uh, activity, but we can't expect things from people unless we also empower them and give uh, and work mm -hmm. on the environment and structural issues. So particularly, how do you deal with that as a politician? Because you, know, you say health is a political choice, but I'm sure some other politicians in your um, city might say health is a personal choice. <laughs> Yes, I do. Uh, not only uh, politicians, also medical doctors. And, and I had a, a, an exchange with a medical doctor lately say, oh, we spend lots of money on obesity. People have just to make an effort. I was like not knowing how it goes and not knowing how those things happen, and e even for mental health. And that's uh, how are we a caring city? How do we take into account uh, the, the barriers uh, and the, the social inequalities that makes that in France right now, and we, we didn't manage, a new minister is making a new tobacco plan very strong, but we didn't manage to load down uh, the tobacco. We did uh, for the uh, richer person, for the people with highest income, but not for the poorer people, and they are the ones who are smoking more, and we have more problem of obesity and more problem with air pollution, and so it is a health gradient. So what we do for mental health and the rest, but I think mental health is about 30 to 40 percent of my time because it's a big issue. And in mental health, I put everything, including alcohol issues, which are pretty high in our our, our cities. Uh, what you do without us? for us is against us. Uh, is something that I've been said for many cases. It's something that's really leading on, on, on mental health. We have to empower communities. We have to go and see the people and say, hey, you know tobacco is not good, so you're smoking, so what can we do? How do we empower the community? How do we make solidarity in between each other? Uh, we have, for instance, in a, one of our city, a food truck women, and they're women from a neighborhood. They're women with difficult background, they've got problem expressing themselves, but they are leading a really strong project on helping the people to cook fruits and vegetables when they got it from the, you know, the food bank. Because people in the food bank, they're not taking the fruits. They don't know. They don't know how to cook the vegetable. So they're making real funny uh, animations and, and asking people, hey, how do you cook that in your country? And they're making them take pictures and send the picture back. And so they get points. And so it's an animation that's made by the people of the neighborhood for the people of the neighborhood. And I'm trying to get the money for the people to do that. 
And the thing is that if national level for mental health is not acting, then the city, we have to deal with it. Because at the last moment, at least in France and many European countries, the mayor is, they, they come for us. And so we don't have any more psychologists in one of our poor neighborhood. And so we are paying psychologists from the city money because the government has let up. And it's each time we are caring about the people, each time we are listening to them, it's win-win strategy because they know better. So we're not wasting the public money on campaigns that don't work. We are wasting the money, giving the money so the people are actually acting and pouring and then able to make, change, to make choices and healthy choices, but their choices, not me saying, oh, don't drink, don't smoke. Dr. Adley, if you were elected mayor of Berlin, what would you do? <laughs> You mean health-wise, <laughs> um, but because there's a lot more than that that I would do. Um, <laughs> well, mental health-wise, um, if if it's true that that our cities are growing so rapidly, and if it's true that the risk for uh, suffering from major psychiatric diseases is largely increased for urban dwellers, and if it's also true that this is social stress related, then it's important to, um, to, to provide um, public space which, which uh, protects against social isolation, one of the most important social stressors, as I pointed out in, the, in my talk. Provide and protect public spaces, uh, that it's green spaces, little parks, little, little areas, um, um, uh, uh, streets, etc., um, because they are important. They're, they're each public space, each little park has a public health relevance uh, for the urban dwellers. Th that's one thing. And, and the other is um, um, try to provide, um, um, tr try to pr protect people from feeling overcrowded or feeling um, um, or having no private space to. Um, um, which gives them, a, which gives them uh, a feeling of security that starts with adequate housing conditions, um, for example, um, and also um, uh, particularly f focusing on high-risk population uh, in urban areas, people with a migration history, older people with a, uh, with a decreasing um, uh, action uh, uh, space because they can't move, uh, adequately, um, which again means a high risk, risk for, um, uh, for social isolation. So to sum it up, more, more public space, uh, um, no, no subjective overcrowding and identifying high risk population and protect them. Thank you. You know this is webcast, so maybe the real mayor of Berlin is listening in. Uh, anyhow, we can uh, ask him to do that later. Jose, uh, there is uh, perhaps a, a, a question that's uh, on some people's mind. There's always this issue, if we do these local strategies, do we go in in that general strategic way, as the WHO Healthy Cities Project did, or does one enter it through a specific disease? And uh, so you've chosen to enter it, of course, because of your organization through HIV AIDS. There's another big initiative now from Blomberg on NCDs, et cetera. And you know, do you, then there's Resilient Cities Initiative from Rockefeller. There's you know, all kinds of things out there. In some cases, cities have to pay contributions. You know, there's, so if you're a mayor like Charlotte and you sort of sit there and say, my God, you know what now, another city initiative and they want me to join. But how do you see that interface and uh, why did you think it necessary you know, to start that in quote separate initiative and how do you think it relates to others like the NCD, like the Healthy City? The why for the Fast Track Cities Initiative is, is really a why now, um, and it relates to the science of HIV medicine, tr a tremendous transformation over the last few years that identified the power of antiretroviral therapy and as important other biomedical interventions to both curb acquisition of HIV and transmission to levels that we had never imagined. That then allowed us to model and then demonstrate through public health impact assessment surveys that we can 
achieve HIV epidemic control. So that, that required a very focused initiative that would allow us to work with the highest HIV burden cities around the world to place them on a trajectory towards HIV epidemic control, recognizing, as you so rightly said, that mayors are approached with any number of initiatives, some of them costing money, ours not, um, that they're asked to sign on to, either political declarations or engaging in actual programming and interventions. Um, in, because we recognize that, Fast Track Cities Initiative is making linkages with other city initiatives to ensure that where we can leverage the resources and the activities of other initiatives, we can do so. But as important, we're helping to integrate within some of these initiatives, including the Resilient Cities Initiative, an HIV component that's missing. Um, and finally, as important, the Fast Track Cities Initiative is looking at ways of fast tracking multiple responses. And so going forward, the idea of addressing comorbidities associated with HIV, from viral hepatitis to amplifying our work around tuberculosis to dealing with non-communicable diseases such as depression, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and cervical cancer, these are all areas where we think we can provide added value and partnership with other city initiatives. Thank you. I'd like to ask you if there's one or two questions or comments. Here's a first one up, up there, please, the gentleman. I'm going to collect a couple and then uh, ask our panel to respond, and then we'll have to, to round up. Please be very short. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Ben Mayer from the German Healthcare Partnership. I have a specific question about uh, commercial advertising public spaces in cities. Um, maybe to you, Dr. Adley, how much of an impact does commercial advertising have on mental health of people? Um, because the city of Sao Paulo has restricted it heavily, and perhaps to the mayor, um, Ms. Marchandiz, um, is it easy to limit commercial advertising because obviously it brings a lot of revenue? Thank you. Thank you. There was uh, another, yes, just down here, the lady. Hi, thank you. My name is Nadi Kong, and I work for Cities Rise, a mental health initiative. Um, and one of the questions that I had for the panelists was what role technology has had in some of your initiatives and movements. Thanks. Thank you. I think right uh, in front here, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paolo Villari and I'm uh, from uh, Sapienza Not University in of Rome. I have not a very mm, specific question not about, not the association <coughs> sorry, about the association not between not urbanization and, uh, and mental health. And not, I agree not, with you that um, I mean, not, this association not, is very tricky not, in the sense not, that uh, there are many not, confounders that not, you have not, to take not, into account, not, but mainly not, it's very tricky not, because uh, if this art association not, is true, not, this is negative not, for mental health, not, but it's positive. There is a positive not, association not, with other good things. Not, and you are right, not, I agree not, with you that there is a sort not, of urban advantage. So, I mean, not, my question not, is very specific. Not, I agree, not, I agree not, on the a positive message of uh, this uh, session not in the sense that we have wanted to talk not about urbanization and cities as a great opportunity not to improve health. So not my specific question not is uh, what not we do not to convince more politicians? Something is uh, already not said, was already said, not, but maybe not that not I can have not a specific comment not on that not from the colleague not of uh, Berlin, uh, also not from you, Ilona. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone on this side uh, that uh, would like to ask a question or raise a point? Yes, back there. Hi, uh, uh, Yusuf Chikta from uh, University of Southern Boss, South Africa. Uh, the, the extent to which you have drug trafficking and drug addiction um, with urbanization taking place and from the Philippines to New Mexico, how does one treat that in terms of the rule of law? Thank you. Okay, and last one right here in the middle, please. Pass it through quickly, quickly, quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Paul Simpson from the British Medical Journal. A lot of the um, uh, the conversation has been about 
uh, interventions on, a, on an individual level, so care-seeking behaviour um, or education type uh, interventions. Um, but I wondered about um, maybe the population level interventions that are often less politically palatable. And, uh, and I wondered if we could sort of touch on some of them and how we can make those work, because their impact can be very broad. So taxes, congestion charges, those types of uh, interventions that would be quite interesting to hear about. Thank you. So I'll go back to the panel. Let's start with Madam Minister. How do you make it politically uh, attractive to do these things? What opposition do you see, perhaps? Uh, how can you move it forward, particularly in relation to some of the structural issues mentioned here? Um, first on how do we make it attractive to politicians and business leaders, and then maybe about population health a little bit and population initiatives. Um, I think the minute um, uh, we uh, make everyone understand that health makes business sense, it makes political sense, that it's important to you, um, uh, that's when you really get the, the understanding. So in Qatar, we're very lucky because our government is very enlightened and our ruler and our, um, uh, our emir is very enlightened and, and does understand the importance of um, uh, health in all aspects of the city. It's also very important to focus um, the politicians on, on, um, uh, on the impact of the decisions they make today on the future generations. In terms of business industry, it's also important that when you have strong consumers, and that's why it's important to educate your consumers and your public, when you have strong consumers, they will force business to um, uh, provide them with the right choices. So that's really important that we focus on empowering the, and creating champions, basically, for, pub for public health. In terms of population health initiatives, yes, the evidence is there that they do make a difference. So increasing taxes makes a difference. And what we're doing in Qatar right now is we recently introduced uh, tobacco taxes. We're working on introducing sugar taxes, fat taxes. So some cities have done a great job in that. So New York, for example, is a good example. Uh, Hong Kong has done uh, really well in terms of taxes and, and implementing population taxes. So yes, it does make a difference. And yes, it should be... Um, encouraged more. And the important thing about taxes is that health is expensive and if you subsidize health through taxes that, um, that incentivize good behavior and good business, then you can also better fund health care. Thank you. Dr. Jafarian, could you comment on that as well? What taxation strategies do you have? Are they possible at city level? Not all countries can do that uh, in terms of taxation. But also you might be able to say something about the commercial environment mm -hmm. in a way mm -hmm. and uh, how that is in Tehran and what problems you might be facing. Let me start with some examples. Uh, advertisement of salty snacks is limited in the TV, but you can see in the streets. But, uh, you know, some non-healthy, you know, foods and so on, for example, the cigarettes is, is totally uh, prohibited to be advertised around the country. These are some, uh, some examples, but not enough, I think, uh, in relation to tobacco use. Iran is not so bad, but is not as much as good as we uh, want it to be. Uh, so uh, th there was a comment on technology, and I think these is, this is very re related to the advertisement, because the ads are the tools for technology to be, you know, sold out. And technology is related to health, uh, is related to welfare of the people, and also have a lot of consequences. So when we talk about technology, I think always we should have uh, keep our eyes open and the consequences, especially of health, that we are in charge of that. And there are a lot of other consequences of, of technology. I'm not, uh, you know, cons to technology, but I think that we should keep open eyes and the any consequence of any new technology which is sold out because of the p benefit and profit and not always for the welfare of the people. So this is, this is a major uh, question and major, uh, you know, action that we should do. Uh, in, the country, in, in Iran now, there is a tax for tobacco countrywide. And unfortunately, the Ministry of Health wanted to increase the tax for the selling of the tobacco use, uh, uh, products, but it was not passed through the parliament because, the, you know, 
all over the world, the, the tobacco is a very beneficial, you know, trait. So, uh, so it was not uh, agreed upon uh, last year. I hope that the next time we could do that, and uh, this could help. This could be of help to, you know, make more money for uh, health issues. What has been done in the past four years is there is a uh, one percent of the value added tax is directly going to the health sector. So this is a great, you know, uh, budgetary support for our health uh, transformation plan in the country. And uh, I think another issue is that we should inform the people if we are in charge of, uh, you know, improving the people's health and people's life as a whole. Because if the people knows what is going on and what is... What is, uh, we have now the traffic light on many of the food products. So, and, and it is interesting that for uh, carbonated beverages, there was a, a, a lower limit for the sugar, not a, t a higher limit in, a, in my country. And it is in the past two, three years that there is a, a, the higher limit for the sugar and there is a traffic light that, that there are a lot of sugar in this uh, beverage that you are uh, drinking. And it, is this, and it is going now more than maybe 80, 90 percent of food products have this traffic light with red one for sugar or salt or fats and so on. So this, is, this way we can help people to be sensitive to their health. At the same time, we can make regulations. Thank you. Charlotte, how do you deal with the commercial determinants of health in your city and what legal possibilities do you actually have? Uh, well, we're still fighting uh, in France to have these uh, fireworks. Uh, big, big issue, really important. Uh, at local level, uh, we cannot choose the advertisement that we have on our street. Uh, I tried uh, because uh, we had a law forbidding alcohol uh, commercials on the street and the, the wine lobby uh, managed to change it. So now we have on bus stop in front of high schools alcohol advertisement, and I cannot do anything about it. We could do one thing that the city of Grenoble uh, has done, is getting off all the commercials from the streets, which is really a uh, brave and strong political choice uh, that my mayor is not uh, willing to take because it's also lots about the money we get from the advertisement. So we can do things but what we can do is uh, making lots of actions in schools in order to tell the kids what how the advertisement is done what are they selling you as living skills how do we empower people to understand what the advertisement is doing to you uh, a political choice really strong was changing from a, a, a policy that was, okay, don't drink, it's bad, you're going to die, on a risk reduction strategy and saying, okay, if you're taking alcohol, don't drive, if you're taking drugs, don't share um, syringe, uh, syringe. Uh, and, and all these kind of things. This was really hard to, to take it politically and, and going into uh, support don't punish because it's really political but it's working and we've seen the, 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 the numbers uh, in, the, in the hospital on Thursday nights we have 60,000 students in the city low down since we have a risk reduction strategy so there was political choice at work. Another that didn't work, we low down the, the speed on the highway around the city and we had the lobby of cars every day on the local newspaper. And finally, eventually, the, the prefect of the region, the, the mayor, they, they stepped back because we, we were not strong enough. We didn't have the citizens with us. We didn't have the doctors. We didn't have all the people saying, hey, this is public health, this is money. We, it's important, but they were stronger than us. So we have to, to be better than they are. Uh, and then another thing on collective things that we're making, we're making a, a local sustainable food plan for all the schools. We have 80 schools and all the, the retirement houses and we are creating, um, I don't know how to say that, we, we're creating public commons so that we have organic local uh, producer, we're protecting the agriculture lands uh, in order to, to, to have 
sustainable and, and sovereignty on food. So th this is something really public, and we didn't ask the parents if they wanted better food for the kids. It was obvious. And last thing about technology, it's really important that we have public action. Like the sensor, it was public action. We have an application for suicide prevention, which is public. Because if we don't do it, if we don't use technologies uh, with caring, with political issues, with public good with equity, then we let it to the GAFAs. And that's a problem with uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook. And, 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 and we really have to, to, to do something on all commercial parts. Jose, can I ask you perhaps, because the AIDS issue is also so close to the drug issue in many cities, how are you confronted there with that interface, the comorbidities, the regulations that you might actually want to see at city level? Is there something you can share on that? Absolutely. So similar to the Healthy Cities Initiative, we learned a valuable lesson in providing space for community champions, inclusive of people who inject drugs, to inform the discussions at, at, at mayoral level, at local health department level around uh, laws and regulations that need to be changed so that they can be good advocates at, at inclusive national level to change laws. Uh, but it's important you know, to try to pr draw attention to the need for funding, for syringe exchange programs, for uh, literacy around uh, issues were affecting people who inject drugs, and as other substances such as smoking and, and alcohol. On the smoking front, for example, these community champions are, at, at many of these cities are busy trying to educate other people living with HIV AIDS about the increasing risk of lung cancer among people who are living with HIV AIDS who smoke generally more than the general public population does. And so the community champion model for Fast Track Cities is, is working at the moment, and it's a model that we hope to, uh, to amplify in the coming years. Professor Adli, uh, to uh, come back to you, there was this question, you know, we live in a global consumer society. We're actually bombarded everywhere with uh, commercial messages in one way or the other. Does that influence our health? Is that something that should be uh, more in the focus also of politicians and uh, to understand what consequences this actually has? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the psychology behind commercial uh, things is to influence people's behavior. That's what commercials are there for. And um, so in a positive or in a negative sense, uh, people are influenceable. And um, we, we know a lot about uh, the inf influence of, um, of tobacco or alcohol commercial on people's behavior. That's uh, uh, consistently shown. And uh, um, so this is also a channel uh, by which we can, um, you know, which you could in a positive sense, used to, to promote healthy behavior if we use the same uh, techniques uh, as, uh, um, as, as done by the several branches of industries. And one thing I would like to add to it is that we should be aware of, um, of the possibility and the chance of, of influencing city dwellers' behaviors in, uh, in, in general. For example, also by... by um, urban design and um, one example to give you one example it has been nicely shown recently in a study that um, um, that the, the density of tree canopies this was a study f done in Baltimore um, increases the social cohesion and the social interaction of people living under these canopies um, and um, there are also a lot of data which show the impact of green space, uh, accessible green space, which means uh, less than 500 meters uh, to, uh, to where I live, um, on a different kind of uh, um, mental health outcomes, but also behavior and health-related uh, behavior. So there are chances to, to positively influence uh, people's behavior, and we should be very aware of that. And this is also something that city governments should be aware of. Thank you. So actually a strong plea for more green spaces. You know, we got a little bit of green here as well. Uh, uh, rather than all these commercial spaces. And also to be very aware how the commercial sector is actually invading our green spaces. 
One of the issues I always raise is that certain fast uh, drink companies uh, uh, with uh, sweet beverages try uh, usually to uh, commercially support uh, physical activity programs for children in parks, for example. Parks normally don't have advertising space, but if you're a company that supports a physical activity program, you can hang up your flag while the kids are doing their physical activity. So there is also this importance that you highlighted, the public space per se, but then also how that public space is structured, is illustrated. I know some of these beautiful public spaces in Italy. We have some Italian friends sitting here that rather than see the palazzo, you now see you know, a big advertisement for Italian underwear. And uh, these are things that, uh, you know, where we should defend our public spaces also as citizens and as politicians and uh, make them uh, more uh, susceptible to our quality of life and raise our quality of life. I think we've heard how important the political action is. Uh, in all cases, we've heard it needs political decision makers uh, to be in support of the activities. We've heard that the politicians must also understand that this is about uh, political choices, it's about uh, decisions about structures, financial decisions about taxes, decisions about uh, what actually belongs to the citizens, their public space, and we've heard in present times how difficult it is to protect that public space because of financial uh, challenges that uh, governments face. Uh, we've heard how uh, many other actors like universities, like international organizations can move this agenda forward. We've heard how important the participation is, the specific gender uh, programs, the community activists and champions who help other more vulnerable people in the community. So a very, very integrated strategy at the local level that we can and need to take forward. And I would encourage all of you, all of you live probably in an urban environment to become one of those champions, to champion uh, your city decision makers to actually put health high on the agenda, to have health impact assessments, and to increase the urban quality of life, health, and well-being. Thank you very much, and thank you to a wonderful panel.